эту сессию я хотела бы все-таки тоже сама открыть. I would like to open this session myself and do this uh, with the great uh, um, energy, uh, personal energy, if I may say so. Uh, Yuri Sinakosov uh, is here. Uh, I am his wife. And uh, it happened so that uh, we um, who were not allowed to go out uh, to go out of uh, Russia, but then in that first year of the free Russia, while you, uh, Andrei Alexandrovich Zaharov, were sitting in the Russian parliament, we were able to cross the boundary of what was at that time already Russia with our own Russian passports. For 50 years, we had not been able to do that. But when we eventually crossed the border, we uh, were received very warmly in a beautiful Paris home in the family, which uh, was very kind to us. We have uh, talked and we talked about uh, very lofty things. We talked about uh, democracy, about Russia entering Europe, and uh, we spoke about plans. And uh, we were uh, indeed uh, very enthused. But, um, and it appears that, that Europe was uh, really on the verge of, uh, of making this uh, amazing coalescence of the unique European way a common way. And in two months, uh, having got back to, to, uh, to Moscow, and after the August coup, and we already stood by the White House, and uh, uh, suddenly we have uh, this telephone call from our French friends, uh, and we're told uh, that, uh, that uh, General Secretary of the Council of Europe, uh, uh, Madame Catherine Lalumiere uh, would be visiting um, Russia uh, to meet with President Yeltsin for about uh, 45 minutes, and then uh, we told them, uh, we told her that it would be good to, to enter a good Moscow home. Now, the General Secretary of uh, of the Council of Europe and the Chairman of the, of the European Parliament are different persons, different positions, and by that time I had already known it. I knew it already. So, uh, at uh, half past eight, I see this uh, exquisite French lady, the General Secretary, and uh, uh, clearly, uh, everything uh, French uh, seemed to us as celestial in those years following the utter grayness uh, of uh, the Soviet times. And so the general secretary, um, this uh, uh, beauty of beauties is uh, accompanied by, uh, by a group of men. Uh, and they are telling us uh, that uh, uh, that we talk about projects, so we talk about uh, how Russia is being uh, uh, awaited in Europe and that we're running towards and rushing towards Europe. And against the background of this rush, uh, we were told that uh, you have a project uh, that may help us uh, to rush towards each other. And so we gave these uh, three pages of our project draft in English. And they said, all right, we shall take a look at it. And in a year, I was invited uh, to the office of the General Secretary of the Council of Europe. Uh, my French friends uh, uh, took me from Paris uh, to Strasbourg. And uh, this is how this school was born. Uh, of course, uh, the words uh, founders, uh, there are several founders in this, in this room, it is true, uh, but we have co-founders. And these co-founders are Tiana Pinto, who is uh, right next to me, and uh, her husband, um, um, French uh, political philosopher, um, 
Dominique Moisy. We published uh, his book and translated it into Russian. It is. Uh, it has been published in the in the Moscow uh, School um, Library, and we also translated uh, Diana's uh, book. And this is indeed. Uh, um, uh, was one of the first books uh, published by by our uh, school. Uh, Diana considers uh, uh, why is it that she chose Europe, having lived in in the United States and having been in Harvard. She d it is not that she describes uh, why she chose to live in Europe, but no, she talks about this very uh, uh, interesting uh, nuances uh, in that Western culture. Um, I would like to suggest that you read this book which is available on our website alongside with the with the book by Dominique Moisy uh, excellent reading and uh, and a true inspiration the role of uh, psychology uh, is uh, in in uh, in the world politics uh, should not be uh, underestimated. I shall not uh, divert you from the, the subject of this uh, lecture, but I would like to thank Diana uh, cordially for coming uh, and, uh, and joining us here in Oxford. Uh, she um, uh, will uh, talk on uh, the subject uh, uh, which has been uh, uh, postulated in, in, in this program. She's a very close friend. Uh, this is a very close. Um, I think that uh, Diana has not been uh, um, with the school for about five years, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so it is my great pleasure to uh, 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 to welcome her here again uh, in Oxford instead of Golitsina. But this is not to say that Golitsina is in any way disparaged. Uh, Golitsina is, is, is the summit anyway. Thank you, Lena, for these immensely kind words. It's a true pleasure for me to be here with you. And if 1991, it sounds almost like ancient history. Most of you were probably very young children then, if you have even born. Uh, what I chose to talk about today is truly, truly ancient history. For those of you, as I see around the room, it was probably your great-grandparents who were involved in World War II and who played a role in the liberation of Auschwitz on January 27th, 1945, exactly 71 years ago today. Now, who on earth celebrates 71st ser anniversaries? I mean, not even birthday parties are held for 71-year-olds. So um, why did I choose to zero in on this topic? Well, of course, being asked to speak on January 27th was a very good reason. But in reality, it was because in this massive reflection on Russia and Europe, the past and the present, journalism and history, Auschwitz contains in its complexity all the nodes and all the crossing points that uh, are very much still with us today. <coughs> uh, I don't think and I speak here very humbly because I have not come to Russia for a few years. I do not even know what kind of any Holocaust education you receive in your country. I do know that this Holocaust Remember International Holocaust Remembrance Day was created after the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz in the fall of 2005 and implemented starting in 2006. But I'm not even sure that you can push remembrance beyond a certain limit. In other words, time has its own biological historical dimension. And just as the sea inevitably crashes on the sand and eats up parts of the coast, and today with global warming, it's becoming ever more frequent, we in France have lost about 100 meters of coastline in the past year alone. Um, what, what shall we do with this particular symbol? Humanity survives from one generation to the other because it learns, but above all, because it forgets. If it does not forget, 
it will be very difficult to carry on the future. Consequently, I'm not going to ask the major big philosophical questions today, but I think I would like to pinpoint this issue of Auschwitz because it has taken a life of its own, and one can even do a history of the commemorations of Auschwitz, and in the process do a history of the links between Russia and Europe down to this day. And I would add to Russia and Europe another subset, a third element, which would be the wider Jewish world, not just incarnated in Israel, but across the Western world today. Now, as we speak, I am told by having used the internet that the president of Poland is at Auschwitz, which seems normal since Auschwitz is in Poland, although even the notion that Auschwitz would be a Polish concentration camp has created anguish amongst the Poles since they were not responsible for Auschwitz, of course. It was Nazi Germany. So the president of Poland is there right now with only one other president from Slovakia, and I'm told that what is being done right there is the commemoration under the theme of the return. In other words, this is the year's topic, the return of those who survived. And they're commemorating one Andrzej Pileki, who was a Polish resistance fighter, who tried to convey or bring information to the Allies, mainly the Western Allies, that there were camps and that there was a Holocaust going on. And he is being honored, and for what? He's being honored because of what he tried to do, but in the current Polish context, he's also, I think, being honored because he was sentenced to death in 1948 by the communist government of Poland for accusations of treason. And in the current political context of Poland, the notion that one has to commemorate and remember someone shot after World War II by the communist regime is not a neutral statement. Auschwitz today, and continues to be the case, is relived constantly in the present. Benedetto Croce, the Italian philosopher, said that all past history was really the present. William Faulkner, the American novelist, said that the past isn't dead, it's not even past. And I think there's no more example of this than the Auschwitz reference. Today as well, in the French press and in some of the American press, there's a smirkish smirk of a notion that the French president, Francois Hollande, is not at Auschwitz. One doesn't go to Auschwitz every year as one is a head of state because he's busy receiving and welcoming the president of Iran. Under theme, Iran, whose charter currently says that Israel must be destroyed off the map, is now, thanks to the lifting of sanctions, being welcomed, President Rouhani was in Italy and is now in France, and therefore shortcut deduction, Hollande forgets everything about Auschwitz and is welcoming the President of Iran. I'm giving you these two examples to show that this word Auschwitz has become a reference, a symbol beyond the reality that it was. It's a shadow that I don't think is going to go away very rapidly. I need not express, but I will do it nevertheless, the fact that one year ago, today, for the massive 70th anniversary commemorations, the headlines of the world, and I'm sure even more so the headlines of your Russian press, stated the fact that Vladimir Putin was not going to be at Auschwitz because he had not been invited. The complexity of the reality is twofold. He was not in, the Poles were not keen to have him there because of Ukraine but they could not invite him or not invite him. Consequently, a solution was found that the letter of invitation from the Auschwitz International Council went to all the embassies of the world saying, come and choose whoever you want to bring along. And consequently, for most of the Western European countries, the presidents came, or the chancellor, of course. But Putin took it, interpreted as a very personal affront to Russia, Russia, whose Soviet incarnation had, of course, freed the camp in 1945. And the scandal was further accentuated when one minister of the Polish government made a point of saying that, after all, it was the great Ukrainian army that had liberated Auschwitz. You could not imagine a more burning reference with respect to what was going on in the Ukraine last year. 
Lavrov, your foreign minister, immediately replied by saying that, of course, the troops that liberated Auschwitz were the Soviet army, the Great Red Army, and they even produced and published a paper showing who was exactly, how many numbers of fighters were coming from as far away as Azerbaijan to liberate Auschwitz. So I need not tell you, uh, what does it mean? How is it that after the world has understood what actually went on there, it could become or fall back into what I would call petty contemporary politics after Auschwitz had been erected into this massive symbol of horror, of human horror, of what one human being can do to another. So I thought I would like to show you that Auschwitz stands today as a proof of history as a corrective, history as prejudice, history as polemic, and the commemorations are themselves a chapter or a piece of that history. So why do I sigh? Because my feeling is that the Auschwitz icon reached its most positive moment 11 years ago in 2005, and that we may be going downhill, banalizing it and turning it into something that it was not through the use and petty use of politicians down the road. The one question I would like to raise with you before I explain, and I will go through because I think it's quite interesting, tend the, the Auschwitz commemorations every decade since 1945. And I want, as a key question, to ask you, um, is the ultimate truth universal? Is a universal rendering of Auschwitz a correct rendering of Auschwitz? Does one attain the universal through the particular, or is the particular robbing the universal of some specificity? Are there false universals? What should we do with the great notion of the anti-fascist universal that dominated Auschwitz in the immediate years after it was liberated? Was Auschwitz always Auschwitz? No. And it has to be looked at Specifically, because beyond the polemics, there is a historical reality. And beyond that historical reality, it's a corrective to what journalists from across the world have made of this particular reference as a soundbite with incomplete information, partisan information, not in the sense of the old partisans, but of one side, across the world. So let me go back immediately to the beginning of it all, January 27th, 71 years ago. The camp is, is discovered by surprise as the Red Army rushes forward toward Berlin. At the beginning, when one sees the prisoners, the, the Soviets are not quite sure that they not be, may not be Nazis in disguise or baits put into a place to bring the soldiers in and to have them being killed. They securized the zone before entering it on the second day, which means on the 28th of January. People with tongues and survivors who replied, and with the passage of time, and this will be important about 2010, start remembering that the Soviet troops were not as shocked as they could have been upon seeing the emaciated people and the piles of cadavers. And this has been a very much of a Western comment on the fact that the Soviet army liberated but was not shocked by what it saw. And I must confess that I did not fully understand this, although I am a historian by training and have studied the period, until I started reading about a month, two months ago the work of your, the recent Nobel Prize winner, Svetlana Alexievich. In her daily the description of war is not for women, I don't know how it's the real word and the real title in Russian. The indirect explanation of the horrors that took place in Belarusia, around Minsk and beyond, were such that one can fully understand why the soldiers of the Red Army, who had already been fighting since 1941, across what Timothy Snyder calls the bloodlands, up north toward the Baltic states, when you saw the horror on a daily matter, when you arrive at Auschwitz, probably the only thing that struck them was that there was just much more of it focused on one piece of land 
it was not the qualitative jump that Western journalists and soldiers experienced when they discovered the westernmost camps of Bergen-Belsen and even the one in France of the Struthof. They had not been submitted and subjected since 1941 to the horrors that the Red Army saw. And they face placent, rather well-fed German populations and Austrian populations and even French populations. And the contrast between what they saw there and outside was massive. The contrast between what the Red Army saw in Auschwitz and what was lying around Auschwitz was not that massive. You cannot just talk about horror and numbers as though it did not matter. But I think I, as a Westerner, fully understood this only by reading the magnificent pages of Svetlana Alexievich. Now, um, the Soviet troops who entered the war in 1941 actually encountered Nazi atrocities practically as the fires were still smoldering in the overall, what has now come to be called Holocaust, in and around the Baltic states. Soviet photographers in their great majority, for reasons that are complicated to describe, and I cannot do this right now, many of them were Jewish. But they were also valiant Soviet patriots. However, and there was a magnificent exhibition on this topic in Paris last year, by the complexity of the Soviet archaeology, shall we say, power situation, they were not allowed. They may have taken private photographs, but they were not allowed to photograph the Jewish symbols that accompanied many of the horrible Jewish deaths in what is now known as the Holocaust. They were allowed to photograph the bodies, but not, or not to really underscore the horror of what they saw in terms of what had happened to the Jews. This was an anti-fascist statement against what Hitler and the Nazis had done. Um, we, I mean, I don't have to go through this very quickly, but obviously, as you well know, uh, Poland and most of the uh, concentration camps lay inside the orbit of the communist world and the Soviet sphere. Consequently, the silencing of specific identities, which had begun for normal reasons in the great anti-fascist struggle, the silencing of these identities became ever more prevalent in the years that followed, starting with the takeover in Poland in 47, 48. What does this mean? It meant that there were two different types of memories that were erased, or at any rate, minimized. The Polish suffering, the Polish horror, what was done to the Poles was minimized and put under silence in the name of universal anti-fascism. You must understand, to understand the Poles today, one doesn't have to go back with Trotsky's armies trying to get to Poland in 1920, or go back, although it was mentioned this morning, about the whole problem of the Third Rome against Catholic Lithuania, as was mentioned. Of course, Catholic Lithuania was the great Polish-Lithuanian entity that was not orthodox. In Polish memory, what stands out is that in 1944, during the Polish insurrection, not the ghetto insurrection of 1943, but the Polish insurrection of 1944, the Soviet army stood at Prada, Praga across the Vistula and waited for the Nazis to destroy the elites of Poland. And of course, the coming out in 1991, I believe, of Gorbachev's truth saying that the murders of Katyn had not been done by the Soviet army, by the Nazis, but by the Soviets, all of this creates a context that makes for a very complicated link between the Russian past, honorable, courageous, and not so honorable or courageous in terms of the political choices, very complex when looking at the Western understanding of what happened at Auschwitz. So what do you have? You have a Polish national, Catholic, underground version of the horror of Auschwitz, one that is minimized by the communist power for, from 1948 till the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, in term, technical terms. And a second overwhelming other memory 
also buried, which was the Jewish memory of who had died at Auschwitz. And not only do you have to do the digging out of the anti-fascist Soviet memory, but then you're left with two antithetical memories that fought it out in the 1990s until some kind of order was reestablished in what was the place called Auschwitz. And the battles of memory of the 1980s and especially the 1990s and all the way through to 2000, I will try to get to them very quickly because I think these are historical truths that may be unpleasant for all sides, but one cannot build a pacified or calm environment without confronting them. And I am not sure, and this is where when I finish speaking, I will certainly rely on your testimony and, not, and questions if you have any, to understand where things lie inside the vast Russian state of today. With respect to this, and I will add also a very complicated other story, which is the Jewish story throughout all of this, which has ups and downs and complexities that are becoming ever more visible today. So let me just give you one technical position. After the communists, the Red Army arrived in Auschwitz, and people understood that Auschwitz was the biggest camp of all, the figure of four million victims in Auschwitz was the supreme figure that was carried out through at least the 1980s. Four million people dying at Auschwitz, interned and most of them dying at Auschwitz. Before I continue with this presentation, I'd like to give you the final numbers, if I can say that. The final numbers to the final solution sounds horrible. The estimated, practically now more or less certain numbers. What are they? 1,095,000 Jews deported to Auschwitz, 960,000 murdered, 147,000 Poles deported, 74,000 murdered, 23,000 Roma and Sinti, Roma Sinti, 21,000 murdered. And then the statistics speak about others. What are the others? That is probably the next chapter that will have to be discovered. Were they homosexuals? Were they criminals? Were they political prisoners? It's one of the other questions because there were about, it's called about 20,000 slave laborers. It's interesting, they didn't fit in any of these three noble categories, so they're left hanging around. And I hope something more will come out of them. So from the four million iconic, almost religious notion, comes the notion of at last, most, at most, one million point two. Now, to give you an example of the complexity of numbers, of history, of memory, and of current temporary, of current political challenges, when these numbers came out, the first reaction of the Holocaust deniers, of which there are many, there were many in France and elsewhere, was to say, ha, huh, so this wasn't six million Jews. You mean 960,000 only died, only? Uh, come on. It's going on in our direction. It's going to prove ultimately that the Jews were not really gassed at Auschwitz. Only lice were gassed there. Consequently, uh, everything becomes polemical. Everything becomes controversial. Everything can be misused in this horror of human horrors that carries the name of Auschwitz. Now, why did it become a symbol? Because it was the largest of the camps. It was also because the camp with the greatest number of survivors. The only people uh, who did not survive, and this is definitely pertinent for you, and for all of us, why, why should I say only you, are the 25, 24,000 Soviet interned prisoners of war on whom the whole notion of using gas to murder them was first tried out. They all died, there were no survivors, there were no Soviet survivors. Had they been there, by being found, they would have been shot in Stalin's camps or somewhere else because there was only one law that was given up from Stalin down in the Red Army. You are not to be made a prisoner. If you're going to become a prisoner, you will shoot yourself. Any person who's a prisoner has become a traitor to the Soviet cause and therefore unreliable. It's a terrible truth to understand and explain. And when one 
looks at the historical references, and I will get to 2012, when one is celebrating the 60th anniversary of Stalingrad. Contemporary, neither Nazi, no pro-communist positions made one point. Yes, we were all happy that the Soviets survived and won in Stalingrad. But that encounter was really the encounter of two armies that were fighting each other to death with two secret service, NKVD on the on one end, and the, and the Nazi troops standing there behind the front lines, ready to kill anyone who walked away, moved away, or was caught. So the most noble of the battles, especially in the Soviet and Russian past, and I'm not denying that for one second, can be seen in a more neutral position as the battles between two armies grabbed and taken in part by their uh, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes that did not equal, and this is a Western reading, the battling of British soldiers or American soldiers on the same terrain. I know I'm walking on very delicate issues with you and your own national, not only national, but even personal and private paths. And I excuse myself for this, but in a sense, I'm in a situation in which I'm in the opposite of Guriev's position. I can answer every question, and I can take positions and freely and independently. Now, the battles. So, um, there was, in the Western publicity and propaganda in the Cold War years, the discovery that the filming of the liberation of Auschwitz had been not falsified, but reconstructed. In other words, when the troops entered, they were not filming, so they put everyone aligned together, and three days or four days later, they filmed the official entering of the Soviets inside Auschwitz. Well, let me tell you the truth, and truth is important. The same thing happened when the British entered Bergen-Belsen. Because if you enter a camp and you don't know what's happening, you're not, nowadays our fancy armies have cameras on top of their helmets, right? Back then, you were there with a machine gun trying to make sure that no one was going to be killing you. You weren't filming. And so this recreation that creates problems for historians was a matter of fact of what was happening in those days in April, January starting with the Soviet Union and all the way down to April and even May 1945 for all armies. So you have this Cold War debate that goes on for the period, you know, we against them. And so, I can't give you the entire history, nor would you be interested in hearing it, but let me go through the six decades. The first commemoration, important one, is in 1955, ten years after the discovery of Auschwitz. We're not exactly in a period of great peace, we're at the height of the Cold War, but one Frenchman, and you may have heard of him, creates the most important icon iconic film, Alain René, in a film called Nuit et Brouillard, Night and Fog, in which he turns for the first time. It's through his camera that one has the iconic photograph of, that you all have in your minds of the entrance into Birkenau, the railroad tracks going through the tunnel with this horrible dark red roofed over garage or hangar as you enter. He creates it, and in that particular film, it is humanity that was destroyed and humanity that destroys the others amongst itself. And the twinning in those years was with Hiroshima. The two horrors of the epoch were Auschwitz and Hiroshima. This is universalism in which neither Poles nor Jews nor others are mentioned. It's universalism by abstraction. It is in the memory of the victims of what was called Hitlerian barbarism, not just anti-fascism, but Hitlerian barbarism. Why? If it was anti-fascism in 1945, it was no longer anti-fascism in 1955, because there was a DDR in East Germany now, part of the Soviet camp, and consequently, what was important was to distinguish East Germany perceived to be the heir of the anti-fascist communist resistance of the 1930s versus corrupt, decadent, fascist West Germany. Consequently, the Hitlerian barbarism was much more important as a definition because West Germany was deemed to be the heir of that particular Nazi moment and not innocent East Germany. 
This was the setting for 1955. Ten years later, we are in 1965. We are in the midst of the very important trial in Frankfurt of the Auschwitz prison guards. This is a trial that is, has now been popularized in films, and perhaps they've reached Russia. One of them is The Labyrinth of Silence. There's going to be another film coming out as well on how one prosecutor got young people to actually start indicting and looking for these horrors done at Auschwitz. And the beginning is so simple that they start saying, they bring in survivors and they say, can you give me the name of the person who beat you up? Or can you give me the name of the unit? And the, uh, the, for the survivor of an Auschwitz experience, this was like being asked to answer a Chinese question. I mean, the name of the person who beat me up. How about the names of this whole process of industrialized mass murder? And in this particular moment, it becomes very important because the prison guards are brought to Auschwitz as part of the indictment or investigation that the Frankfurt court is taking place, is holding as is happening. The guards are brought back, but again, it's a West German history, not an East German one. East Germans were all lily white and perfectly innocent, except a few that might have been taken and therefore tried. What is interesting about 1965 is that the great universal anti-fascist resistance and then the universal vision of 1955 begins to collapse. And what you have is a desire to create national pavilions and to memorize, commemorate uh, the, the end of this horror by having different countries produce their own national pavilion, which is a crack in the universalism of the beginning. And the national pavilions and the description of Auschwitz by national identities remains intact at Auschwitz until 1990-91. I personally saw the entrance ticket of the, of the Auschwitz uh, camp in 1991, and you had the pavilions starting with Austria and ending with the last of the last, which had no national pavilion really, the Zids, in other words, the Jews. But the tragedy in this element of false universalism was that all the people deported to Auschwitz from the national pavilions were practically at 98% Jews from each one of these countries. Consequently, the Belgians, it was not the Belgians, it was the Jews of Belgium. The Croats, it was not the Croats, the Yugoslavs, it was not the, the Yugoslavs, it was the Jews of Yugoslavia. So here was one turning into national identity, something that was very specific about the history of each group. And in 1965, the ceremonies are highly ideological. And what they bring together are the Soviets, communists of Poland, and the communist parties of Western Europe. The non-communist parties of Western Europe are not really invited because they're still fascist in a wider sense. And consequently, national pavilions of resistors, basically Jews in reality, not resistors at that point, plus only the left-wing parties of the West that are present. In 1975, I'm sk skipping very quickly, the first visit of a United States president, Gerald Ford, the Auschwitz take on another dimension. It's the Cambodian genocide and the discovery that man can produce horrors to other men, not just in a distant World War II past, but in a hot burning day today. In other words, Pol Pot in Cambodia. This is a very harrowing and very complicated twinning. There's a second twinning which is much more complicated, and I don't wish to be misunderstood on this. It is that in Western Europe and in the United States, 1975 more or less marks the beginning of the translations and the central popularity of Solzhenitsyn and his Gulag Archipelago. And all of a sudden, the great anti-fascist resistance, whereby only the Nazis committed horrors, Although people knew about it, the reality in terms of wider public opinion, what was the gulag, hits home with Pol Pot on one end and the gulag on the other. I'm making very quick historical comp moments because that is how memories work, by quick associations, even though they're, they're wrong. So you have on one end the discovery of, ha, huh, maybe the Soviet Union is not quite 
what it, we always assumed it had to be. I mean, this I'm talking about wider public, public, not just those who knew about what had happened in 56, the 20th Party Congress, and so forth. And at the same time, it's also the beginning of the Helsinki process. So you have this fusion of very incompatible, strange memories that hit the scene at the same point. But somehow, the setting is created in which, for many people, what happened in the Nazi camps and what happened in the Soviet camps is made to a kind of, ah, same horror. In other words, neither fascist nor communist. I'm simplifying again, of course. And bear with me, I know that for everything I say, there are 27 commas, punctuation points that have to be added. But I'm doing this schematically. And in this thing, of course, will fall one day Vasily Grossman's life and death. And the mere fact that he died without ever seeing it published and that it was published miraculously is attributed to the fact that he, or technically speaking, this is a novel about the horrors of the Nazi camps, but it rang so true to the people in power in the Politburo that he was actually hounded practically to death over this unpublished manuscript, which only lent more credence to, my goodness, that century, let's destroy it all, and why not? in a sense, the Soviet Union in the process. All right, fast forward to 1985. 40 years later, Western Europe and the Western world is in a mood for reconciliation. You can say it's biblical, 40 years in the desert, and then you come out of the desert. America decides that Western Europe has to, that the time has come to make some kind of gesture of reconciliation with Germany over the past and not just about more you know, defense or NATO or whatever that is going on very well for the present. I do not know if you know the entire debate over the cemetery at Bitburg where Ronald Reagan was asked to go and lay a wreath to the soldiers of the Wehrmacht at that point still perceived as quite different from the SS troops the army has the nobility of being the defender of the country. And when the time comes for him to lay this wreath, discovery, there are also stormtroopers of the SS buried in this particular cemetery. How on earth can you do a reconciliation with the ultimate agents of horror and death? <coughs> Complete craziness, yes, no, we go, he goes, but he doesn't look at those tombs. And what is very interesting is that 10 years later, in Germany itself, the Wehrmacht itself has been prone to, to has been shown to be hardly the good patriotic army that does its proper military work, but a total accomplice for the final solution. Without the Wehrmacht there, the stormtroopers could not have done it, would not have killed the millions of Jews who were not in Auschwitz, but are called the Shoah, the Holocaust, by bullets. So you have these moments of, in which you commemorate, and at the same time, it opens up something, and then you create a new wave, it's sort of like dialectical, of discovery of a completely different story within Germany, and perhaps there's no country on earth that has looked at its past in the magnificent, if I can say the word magnificent, impressive way as Germany and united Germany today. But 1985 is also a very strange moment. It is the beginning or what will become the great struggle of the 1990s, which memory of which victims at Auschwitz. The church, the Catholic Church of Poland decides, it accepts the request of Carmelite nuns to go pray for eternity at Auschwitz for redemption. And it is the beginning of a major struggle of should there be prayer at Auschwitz? That had not been a problem during the communist period. There was no God, there was nothing there, there was just, you, you shut up the Catholics and uh, the Polish Catholics and you just did not mention about that. It was humanity without any deity. The Carmel. The Carmel planted in the middle of what was the most important cemetery or death place of the Jews. And this major theological dispute took place for more than 10 years, 20 years almost, over the fact that no God should be represented at Auschwitz, and certainly not turn Auschwitz into a piece of Catholic or Christian theology, or teleology, in other words, absolve all of humanity through a cross, when most of those who were murdered at Auschwitz were not even Christian. And this particular intertwining between the Church of Poland 
and the Pope, John Paul II, and the ambiguities there did probably more than anything else for the rising of a very important Jewish consciousness about how and take care of Auschwitz as a symbol, which was not a uniquely Jewish symbol, but a preponderantly Jewish symbol in terms of numbers, as I showed to you before. And what happens is that two things happen. The Pope arrives, and there is a desire to create martyrs. There are two martyrs that are given in that particular moment of Auschwitz, of the Serb commemorations. One is a Father Kolbe, who took the place of another prisoner, and therefore died voluntarily at to be shot at Auschwitz. And the second one is a Carmelite nun by the name of Edith Stein, who, who was a Jew and who had converted to Catholicism, but she had been grabbed from Germany and taken to Auschwitz, of course, according to Nazi racial definitions of a Jew. And so the mere fact, and the father Kolbe had written massively anti-Semitic pamphlets in the 1930s. Courageous as he was, he was not exactly a the perfect hero. And the notion of turning Edith Sign into a saint opened up the notion that the only good Jew was the Jew who had converted. Or in other words, a Jew who saw the light and therefore espoused Catholicism. And this created a kind of reaction of, wait a minute, you want to put the cross and its shadow over the, over the, over the concentration camp? Then you will, not only that, you're dispossessing the Jews of their identity, their horror and their suffering in the name of Polish martyrology. These were very deep and very bitter struggles, but don't forget in 1985, it's still communist Poland out there. <coughs> the camp is still in the orbit of the Soviet Union. We reach Auschwitz 1995, the 50th anniversary. The 50th anniversary stands as the moment in which the president Lech Walesa, and therefore Solidarność, if you do remember, <clears throat> the great working class moment of trade unionism, comes to power, and they come to power in 89. And so finally, they are in control of Poland, and they are in control of the camp of Auschwitz, even though there's an international council that has been made to start rethinking the whole camp. But the President Valenza gives a long speech in which it's all about Auschwitz, neither Sinti, nor Jews, nor Soviet soldiers, nobody, just Polish martyrs. And in this particular moment, this is the first time in which all sorts of presidents from different countries come. And the president of Germany, United Germany, of course, Roman Herzog, walks out at the end of the ceremony and leads a group of Jews and others to Birkenau, because the ceremony was in Auschwitz itself, leads them for a moment of Jewish commemoration since President Valenza has done nothing to even mention the fact that the camp had been a place of one million Jewish deaths. And this, at that particular point, is a tension between Auschwitz. Auschwitz is the red brick camp, for those of you, I'm sure you do know, the red brick camp with Arbeit macht frei. Birkenau is instead the barracks with the famous trains that led you to the final solution, the crematoriums, and then to the pond where the ashes are. So this was a moment in which Auschwitz was given importance and Birkenau demoted, or not mentioned. Auschwitz 2005, which I do convey to you as being the sort of high point of this infernally complex commemorations. The apogee, every single head of state, including Asian heads of states, goes to Auschwitz for the 60th anniversary commemoration. The ceremony is a rethinking of what happened at the camp and a proper numerical presentation in that it is held at Birkenau as the symbol of the atrocities. It is led by the first speech made by Simon Weil, the Minister of France, who represents the Jewish presence, followed by Władysław Bartoszewski, who was a major actor and player in the Polish underground resistance and even in helping Jews in that period, who speaks for the Polish prisoners of war, and then a Sinti representative. And you have, in a sense, a moment that I would call a moment of historical reconciliation and perhaps even pacification. Everyone's there, including, of course, 2005. It has to be Putin. It's Putin, yes. Uh, everyone. I mean, there's not one major country, Argentina, Brazil, 
uh, Thailand. I mean, it's amazing. You can say how this is, be, you know, the moment of international notion. So this is how it ends from that point of view in the positive sense. What follows is very complicated. Words have come out, silences have ended, reality morphs. The Germans feel that they are capable of having their own suffering mentioned. And all of a sudden, in this breakdown of the Soviet Union, the coming out of the Polish memory, the Russians being put, in a sense, aside from this entire thing, except for the fact that they liberated the camp, Germans start speaking about their own suffering. And what comes out, of course, in German daily discourse is the wave of rapes by the Red Army once they've entered German territory. Rape upon rape, Berlin, and etc. And then, much to my surprise, I see in a 2010 article in a British newspaper that by 2010 you have even young Jewish survivors, young women of the time, who mention how, after having been liberated, they were also raped by members of the Red Army. Consequently, from there, you create crazy elements. One crazy element, to my mind, is the, I'm being very subjective here, the ex post facto swelling of pride of the Israeli Air Force that gets the permission to fly over Auschwitz in 2006, if we had only been there, being the motto. Then I mentioned to you already Stalingrad and the change of perspective. And then it continues. The history continues. The research continues. The politics gets worse and worse until, of course, we reach Auschwitz in 2015 with the psychodramas, the problems, and a final sensation of can we lay all of this politics to rest? Can we not remember what actually happened there? Can we not return perhaps to a new universal dimension of the horror of humanity experienced at Auschwitz and end what was basically throughout most of those years what in English we call the zero-sum game? In other words, if you suffer, my suffering loses a piece of my suffering. In other words, to, for me to really suffer, I can't accept your suffering. And I hope that that will be, with time, the overall mm, comment on uh, what Auschwitz, the real Auschwitz, rather than Auschwitz in quotation marks, will lead us to before perhaps it slowly moves into the sands of history. But right now, in the last two years, my feeling is that for all sorts of reasons, journalistic, historical, and above all, political, Auschwitz is once again becoming a kind of punching ball or football thrown in the air by regimes, whether it be in Russia or in Poland or perhaps elsewhere, that needed to justify themselves in their own public eye.